I was writing the poems in When the Tree Falls over the last four years and during that time my very close friend Shirley McClure and my father were both ill and they both died and so there, this collection is primarily elegiac um, and re reflecting on that time of their illness, their death and also the time of mourning since then. Uh, so I thought I'd start this reading with two poems uh, about Shirley. Copper Sh Souls. In an old Finnish story, the hero must build a boat from oak to bear him home through a raging storm, but he cannot complete his work without three magic words. The first will secure the stern. The second will fasten the ledges. The third will ready the forecastle. To find the words, he must walk across points of needles, edges of hatchets, blades of swords, for which he needs shoes with copper soles. Dear friend, while the doctors chase pain around your body, where will we find such a cobbler? So the, the second poem about Shirley McClure is uh, in the last two years of her life after she got this devastating diagnosis of cancer, uh, I saw her uh, live every day as fully as she could with great courage and determination and this poem uh, tries to capture that. You pull yourself up for the power and pulse that lifts you and your board so you're standing on water, for the sound of the spray when a clean wave breaks in hailstones around you, for the time outside time, when you catch the gust and are swept the full length of the fetch. For the wind like a blade to your neck, the tug of the swell in the moment before you must bail. You pull yourself up. And in, in those years, those past four years, there were two very important referenda in Ireland uh, that both marked a, a great opening of Irish society to a more inclusive, more compassionate, more um, multicultural society in many ways. And uh, the first of those was the marriage equality referendum in 2015, which allowed for the passing of legislation for gay marriage. And um, I was thinking about, in the, in the much greater celebration of lesbian and gay identity that there has been in Irish society since then, I was thinking about what it was like when I and many of my friends were coming out in the 80s. And now there's a bit of a rewriting of that history, almost with a regret for that time. Uh, and uh, this poem is a response to that. Those days, we had to claim a space for love in the half-hidden places. A back room in Smith's, the top floor of a pub on a lane by the Liffey. Looking back, we could say it was worth it for the welcome when we stepped in from the cold, for the pleasure of removing masks with our shrugged off coats, for our bodies pulsing to I will survive. That would be comforting, but a lie. And the other referendum uh, was just last year, May 25th, and it was a referendum that allowed for the passing of legislation uh, for abortion for the very first time in Ireland. And uh, I 
uh, we vote in a polling station just down the end of the road here in an old schoolhouse and it was an absolutely beautiful morning and it, it, we'd had a really hard winter and to me that seemed to symbolise this time of change in Irish society. Polling station, May 25th, 2018. In the queue up to the door of the schoolhouse, Neighbours welcome sunshine after the wettest of wet winters. Spirits lifted at the sight of fields drying out. Grass thickening, calves thriving, unstoppable growth. There's talk of young ones speeding home to vote. Swallows back to the barn. No one asks anyone where they'll place their ex. Every family has stories left like ploughs and harrows among thistles behind the sheds. Um, and I suppose this poem, in a way, is a contrast with the other two poems, because while Irish society is so much more open, uh, there still is uh, homophobia and there still is uh, violence related to homophobia. And just last um, summer, I read an article in the paper about two men who were uh, beaten up with a hurl in Port Leash, and it led to this poem. The Hurley Maker. Under the green grey bark of ash, he seeks malleable wood to shape from curving handle to rounded boss. He thins the body till it bends like a bow, springs like a whip, then planes and sands it smooth to the hand as a thoroughbred's pelt. He's seen his hurleys hoosh cows up the lane after milking, knock hogweed out of a ditch, hoist buckets from a tank, lift ladybirds to count their spots. He's watched young lads practice roll lifts dribbles and solos, the way ravens play with the wind. Years he's waited for his county to raise the cup. But the day his hurley beat two men kissing was the first time he thought to give up. In the collection, I have a number of poems um, about my relationship with my mother. And I wanted to start with one of those, which is an attempt to explore the complexity of the mother-daughter relationship. The trouble. The trouble between mothers and daughters is how to forgive the one to whom you owe too much. What you see when you look in the mirror. How you forget you were in her and she is in you. Or the way she loves you and cannot, will not, leave you alone. Um, my mother, uh, when I was growing up, passed on her skills that she had learned from her mother, um, the traditional homemaking skills, and at the same time she passed on her feminist instinct to me. And this poem tries to capture both of those. Hers. My mother said she knew just knew I was going to be a girl. Two boys before me, 
and two boys after, fodder for a hungry farm. But I was hers. She taught me her tricks of the trade. It looked like dinner is nearly ready if the table is set when he comes in. Bread and butter will fill them up. Add three drops of vinegar to water so your mirrors and windows will gleam. Cool your fingers before rubbing lard into flour for pastry. A handful of ground almonds will keep your fruitcake moist. Darn a few socks every night and never leave the ironing for more than a week. Don't cut off rhubarb stalks with a knife. Twist them clean from the crown. And always hold on to the children's allowance. A woman must have something of her own. Uh, this poem is set the summer before I left home uh, to go to college and um, I suppose in some ways it's about the mother and daughter's shared dreams but also the inevitability of the separation required for the daughter to make a life of her own. Map. She pinned a simplicity pattern on sky blue denim, fed the fabric through the machine, sewing swirl to swirl for the skirt that would take me away from her. Among spools of thread, ribbons, bias bindings and zips, she found the pinking shears and cut the fringed hem. A paper patterns like a map, she said. Arrowheads give direction. Dots mark collars and pockets, where to tuck and pleat. Notches show fittings for waist, hips and breasts. That was when we believed if I followed the map, I could be whoever I wanted to be. And so the, the last few poems uh, that I'd like to read are very, uh, set in that time of when we were nursing my father at home between November 2016 and January 2017 and um, it was a very special time, a very precious time as well as a very painful time and uh, after his death I found myself writing many poems about that time. I've got you. Through days of morphine, titbits to tempt his appetite, there's nowhere else to be. I hold his teacup to his lips, wash his face and the hands I rarely touched. During the night, old hurts and worries surface like stones in a well-tilled field. What time is it now? He asks on the hour. He sings to himself and murmurs lines he learned as a child. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. When he asks to get up, I hold his wrist brace my weight against his. For a moment he's confused. It's okay Janie, I've got you. Go on now, you can stand. And, uh, and this poem I wrote 
quite recently since, um, and I'm struck by how I'm still writing poems from that time and uh, in some ways finishing the collection part of the fear is that I'd stop writing those poems but um, I, don't, I don't know whether there are more there. Cyprus Falling in and out of sleep all night he suddenly struggles to sit up Will you open the curtains so we'll see the dawn when it comes? He gazes out at the cypress that in his lifetime grew higher than the house. A tree that survived every winter's wind, its trunk ridged as a raised bed ready for seed. Feathered foliage set to sprout flower balls. Exposed roots worn bare as bones. Branches touching the ground, forming a haven. A tree to sit in, quiet, waiting. And the next poem is set in the summer, last summer, the summer of 2018. So it was a year and a half after my father died. And it was um, a time of a heat wave, which was both very exciting, but was also very ominous about climate change. So this poem is elegiac for both my father and for the environment. Aftergrass. Lofts full before the end of June. Stoat kits playing in the aftergrass. Cattle clustered in dusty circles among thickets of hazel and ash. Little egrets sentinel still in shallows more shallow than we've ever seen. I sit by my father and tell him the sun has scorched every blade of grass. His headstone's not up, but the wordings agreed. After my father died, my brother, my eldest brother, uh, quite a few times said to me, why did we not record his voice? And um, I find that a very painful question. And for quite a time after Daddy died, I couldn't even imagine his voice. Uh, and then last summer, I, would, I found myself writing this poem, almost like a response to my brother, but I also feel that it, it's, it's about a different stage of mourning when he, the person, is, when he was back in my life and I could feel his presence around me again. Kelly's Garden. You can find him in the names of the fields. Kelly's Garden, Bacchanoctons, Malbranans, the Santole, the Quarry, the Rock. He's stacking square bales, chanting knots in and down, so rain won't lodge in their hearts. March and he's cursing merciless wind, cattle running amok. He's laughing at McAleer's joke about the father who welcomes his eldest home from Alberta or Azerbaijan with the only question that matters, were there many on the bus? You can hear him in the jackdaws, chuck, chuck, up high on galvanised roofs, and in his whistling that rises and falls like the curlew calling from Emla Bog. Gracias.